What's going on everyone? About 76% of the S&P 500 closed down in the red today, so it was uh, another bloodbath, but heading into tomorrow, we have a lot to talk about as volatility is here, it's increasing, and it's uh, only going to increase more as the year goes on, given the current market sentiment, uh, you could say positioning across the market, as well as the upcoming election, and what increasing volatility volatility makes for is more opportunities in both directions. So while the market is definitely crazy right now, it's a good thing because uh, the crazier it gets, the more opportunity there is in multiple different ways. But talking about today's video, we're going to cover what the market normally does in times like this one. We're going to go over some seasonal trends. We're going to talk a little bit about Amazon's record Prime Day, Netflix earnings, and some awesome setups for tomorrow. So hopefully Hopefully today was a great day trading for you, but even if it wasn't, there's one day left for the week, so let's make it a good one. Yeah, and SPY had a pretty bad move today, if you can't tell by looking at the chart yet. Ended up down 0.77%, but you know, the streak without falling 2% still stays alive. You know, we saw that earlier in the week. We were at like 350 days, so now we're going to be a little bit over that. Hopefully, we get an update on that one soon. But yeah, today the SPY had a pretty bad breakdown, Mike. I've actually been watching a pretty big trend line on the SPY over the past couple days. We actually had a pretty good touch yesterday, but this morning we actually fell pretty significantly significantly under that trend and we started breaking that pretty crucial 556 support in the short term so it was a pretty bad breakdown today and a lot of the key tech stocks are what fell again and we've been talking about the rotation out of tech now not everything was down avgo nvidia meta did close up in the green but i mean mike like look at this heat map this is one of the <laughs> worst heat map it's not even just tech today i mean everything was pretty much down in the red but stuff like Microsoft, Google, Apple really led the way. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a sea of red today. And as we look at some of the selling pressure, uh, there's a pretty cool chart that we have to show that showcases the amount of large down days for the S&P 500, not only this year, but it has data going way back, Tom, to 1928. And we can see that there have only been like eight large down days for 2024, which in the grand scheme of things, isn't that much. We can see as we look throughout history, there have been many many, many other years where there are a lot more large down days. And it is worth noting we are, uh, you know, only a little bit like halfway through 2024 so far. So this data is not like fully complete, but I definitely want to showcase this because, you know, obviously the market has just been ripping over the past year. And while that's amazing, it's important to be aware of the fact that, you know, the market cannot just rise every single day as many traders are coming to learn this fact. Like, um, it is normal, healthy, and expected for the market to pull back sometimes, and it's arguably more concerning if there are never any pullbacks at all because markets and stocks like the, like that uh, normally end in a uh, much worse scenario. So either way, uh, I definitely want to showcase that data. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, eight significant down days on the year that's all we're at right i would say that's pretty low uh, like you said we're only around like that halfway mark so you know we might end up like what 16 if we stay on the current pace maybe even less if stocks stay resilient but uh, nonetheless that is a pretty interesting piece of information mike and whenever i start to look at the market here i'm like wow today didn't even count right the spy wasn't even down one percent so uh you know that doesn't even add to the data and look at the nasty red day that we had right um, I just don't know if we could even uh, in the short term see a drop of like 2% on the SPY, right? Uh, the good thing about the SPY, at least, is that it's pretty resilient. You know, if we go to the heat map, I know today it doesn't look resilient, but, you know, there's a lot of times where we might see uh, the majority of tech in the red, but then everything else is green, you know, like banks or healthcare or energy or other sectors that really helps it stay higher, um, which is a good thing. But we do know that tech obviously runs the show. It's just keeping it from falling down. Instead of 2%, it might only get on 1%, right? But obviously, if we continue to have days like this, it's going to get pretty bloody pretty quick. 
And another thing that we uh, should definitely you know note is that while the market uh, has been selling off a decent amount in the short term, when we look at other historical data like this on the chart right here, uh, we could see when we look at like the first trading day of the year to like let's say the first 134 trading days, which just aligns with uh, the current time, we could see that this. Uh, part of the year has been one of the best rallies in stock market history and we can see that historically speaking most of the time the market continues to go up even further so like that second column basically shows the returns from you know day 135 all the way to the year's end and most of the time again the market continues to march higher but it's just worth noting there have been a handful of times throughout history where uh, the, the market definitely uh, pulls back quite a bit. So with this data being said, you know, you just have to constantly be in that adaptive mindset and understand the stocks and setups that you are in. Like there have been a bunch of people that made a bunch of money with chip stocks and AI stocks over the past year. And if you're a part of that group and you know, you have a long-term outlook on those stocks and by all means stick to your thesis, but where the risk truly comes into play is for those who are in positions where they have no strong thesis uh, to them. Like if you're just in a position and you don't feel strongly about it and you don't know why you're actually in the position and you don't know how long you plan to hold it for, that's where things get a lot more risky and that's where it'll be like even more important to truly assess, you know, what, you know, what, what you want to trade and like in what direction. So just be aware of every single setup you're in now because again, we're getting into like a more volatile uh, time of the year. Yeah, we are. And, you know, one thing I noticed about this chart, Mike, is if the first 134 trading days were amazing, you know, those top four <laughs> best days or the top four best halves, I should say, the second half of the year ended up being pretty rough, right? Like, that's pretty bad to see those top four end up red. Hopefully we don't see anything like 1987 where the market pulls back 20% uh, to end the year. But I do like this. Uh, you know, like you said, the majority of these years ended up being uh, being green, obviously overall. But of course, even the second half ended up being green too. So I'm glad to see that. That could still support a nice bull run. And like, let's be realistic here, Mike. Like the market uh, with with where it is now, it could actually pull back quite a bit. And I think uh, still end up green. Like let's say we pull back to like five. 40, right? I think in the short term, people's heads might explode. But just a couple months later, like in November, December, we could come all the way back up and make new highs, right? Kind of like what happened during that two month downtrend back in April and March. So I just keep looking at that April and March pullback and I'm like, you know, I think that we're just kind of due for one of those. I don't think that it's like, you know, like we're going to say like, oh my gosh, we're going to have a crash like 1929 or anything like that. Just pullbacks are necessary and a part of the stock market. Yeah, and they're a good thing because they offer better prices for those who are investing for the long term. So there's definitely uh, pros with uh, pullbacks, but uh, something that we've been saying almost nonstop over the past couple of weeks is the seasonality with VIX right now. And this goes hand in hand with the uh, pullback uh, topic that you were just talking about. Basically, the red line shows the VIX for this year and the gray line show its historical averages uh, for each time of the year. And we could see that we're in in that time of the year where the VIX tends to move up and normally when the VIX goes up the market pulls back so it's like we could see that a lot of times we see VIX increase from about this time to you could say like October to November so just keep in mind like as we head into these next couple months not only do we have to you could say worry about broader positioning broader sentiment broader macroeconomic factors but we also have a strong seasonal trend coming in to play and a crucial election. So it's like you have to be not only aware of this volatility, but you have to position yourself in a way where it's like, you know, you're going to be, you know, in a, in a spot to prosper given an increase in volatility. Yeah, and I'm actually really glad to see volatility starting to pick up here in the short term. I know that uh, a lot of people might not like it because, as we know, whenever the VIX starts to pop up, a lot of times that's associated to market bearishness. And I know, obviously, today that was the case. But if we go look at VIX on the daily, they're starting to become or they're starting to be a pretty good opportunity to the upside here. You know, I've been looking at VIX for a long time. Uh, this this recent pop has been pretty significant, Mike. I don't know, uh, you know, if people have been following the percentages too much, but we were stuck in a bit of a range down there. And since 
at pretty much the bottom of the past two days to the high of today, the VIX ran up 21%. Like that, that's quite a bit. And today's candle was up 10% alone, all the way up to $16. We were just at 13 or 14 just a couple days ago. So, you know, whenever the VIX starts moving, sometimes it can have some extremely volatile good moves. I know a lot of people are looking at UVXY and capitalizing off that today. And we talked about UVXY quite a bit yesterday as well. Yeah, shout out to you, Tom, because you were pretty early to that one. So normally when the VIX uh, does rise, UVXY tends to uh, move in a pretty good way. So shout out to you, Tom, and everyone continue to keep a close eye on this one going forward. But in a more like immediate sense, Tom, uh, we saw some pretty interesting price action in after hours today from Netflix. And uh, as we've been talking about throughout this week, Netflix has been one of the most highly anticipated earning stocks and it is all over the place in after hours. So looking at their earnings, uh, they certainly were not bad. So they beat on their earnings per share uh, estimate. They beat on their revenue estimates. They beat on their membership estimates. And the revenue was up 17% year over year. Um, and overall, the stock is just... Uh, it's just flat in after hours. And I think this says a lot because if Netflix reported this type of earnings, you could say maybe a couple months ago when that market euphoria was like truly at its peak, then I think Netflix would look a whole lot different in after hours right now. And I especially don't think it would have just, uh, you could say got hammered right when the bell rang. Yeah, I don't either. And, you know, whenever I go back and I look at the numbers, I'm like, wow, you know, they pretty much beat expectations on just about everything. I'm not going to say that they blew expectations out of the water, but, you know, they pretty much beat on, on everything. And I even like how they said that they now expect full year revenue growth of 14 to 15 percent up from their original guidance of 13 to 15 percent. So even that. Uh, ticked up a little bit there on that on the bottom side of that range but nonetheless I do like the earnings Mike and whenever I look at Netflix I'm like you know another uh, theta burner right this one's going to be a, a stock that really makes the options traders angry for anybody who bought these ones before earnings especially if it opens where it is now but looking at Netflix on like a broader chart um, you know it's another one of those big tech stocks it's been starting to dip down quite a bit in the short term it's been losing a lot of that good volatility it had all year long and uh, I'm not saying again that it's going to crash and burn but uh, so far the reaction to the earnings isn't the best and if we see tech fall again tomorrow uh, you know as of now it doesn't seem like the earnings are going to be able to help it hold higher yeah, and what's good about earnings, especially in a situation like this where the stock just isn't really moving, what you can do is you can just keep a close eye on this one, not only for tomorrow, but even for next week. And once the stock, like you could say, picks a direction in a more momentum filled way, that's when it can be traded because it's, uh, you know, cool and all to look at stocks before they report earnings. But like you, like, kind of alluded to, the uh, premiums for options traders can be pretty expensive and not in a good way because it's just they're just the options are just fundamentally overpriced in earning situations so basically keep a close eye on Netflix going forward and if it starts to truly move in a momentum filled way to the upside there can be a lot of scalp opportunities there and of course the same thing to the downside but I think for now it would just make the most sense to just sit on the sidelines wait for it to gain momentum and also keep a close eye on the sentiment surrounding the market as a whole but either way good stuff with Netflix there and then Tom I saw Amazon had another record prime day this year. Yeah, they did. So I can't believe that I read this, especially because, you know, whenever you hear about the economy, you hear like, oh my gosh, consumers are hurting. You know, everybody's been kind of complaining over the past year. I know, you know, Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve have been trying to, uh, I'm not going to say trying to hurt consumers, you know, but, uh, but at the end of the day, we know what they're doing at the Federal Reserve. Um, Prime Day, another record one, Mike. So uh looks like they came in with a record $14.2 billion for their two-day event, which is nice, up 11% year over year, according to Adobe Analytics. Uh, Amazon still has to put out their own specific figures, but nonetheless, it's good to hear that a hear that consumers are still spending like this could you imagine the nasty headline if uh, amazon would have missed on their prime day i mean that would that would have been pretty bad 
But Tom, as we look at Amazon stock, it looks like the stock didn't really care about this record <laughs> Prime Day. It uh, definitely fell quite a bit as it uh, is actually below that like $185 level now. So uh, Amazon, even with the good news, uh, still fell. And I think this really goes to show that even though you know certain stocks can have good news right now, uh, that good news can be like outweighed by like broader uh, sentiment in the market overall. And as we look at the heat map, we've seen a lot of weakness, especially with big tech stocks. And of course, Amazon is included in that group. So just keep that in mind going forward, not only with Amazon, but keep in mind the fact that like stocks can have good news, but good news doesn't always equate to rising stock prices. So that is that. And Tom, while earnings week is slowly coming Coming to an end, we still have a, a handful of other companies set to report tomorrow. Yeah, we do. Tomorrow morning, American Express will be reporting Halliburton, ticker symbol HAL, Travelers Insurance, TRV, Huntington, Regions Financials, another one. So a couple more uh, like banks or finance stocks down there as well. Um, obviously, AXP, I think, is going to be the biggest one tomorrow. American Express, like you said, it's dying down a bit. Uh, definitely no Taiwan Semiconductors or Netflix's tomorrow, that's for sure. But uh, <laughs> n- nonetheless, AXP is pretty big. And uh, looking at the economic schedule really quick there is a couple fed speakers but really there's no huge data points tomorrow at all sounds good i like it that way we could focus uh, just on the price action and momentum so let's get right into some setups and predictions then a stock i'm looking at pretty closely right now is citigroup and it is to the downside uh bank stocks as a whole have been doing very well over the past year and citigroup is at that point where it's getting a little bit overextended and it's also coming into an area of some major, major resistance. So if we zoom out on like a longer term chart, we can see this stock made highs uh, basically before the COVID crash happened in like 2020 and 2019. And it made highs again around the same level in 2021, where it's between like 66 to like $70 a share. So basically looking at the stock at this area, there's a decent amount of resistance. The sentiment in the market overall is you could say weakening a bit. And we are just uh, looking at a stock that is a little bit overextended. So I really like the risk reward to the downside here. And uh, I will be watching it pretty closely uh, going forward. I would not be surprised if we saw a retest of around that like $63 area, depending on the sentiment with the market over these next couple trading days. Yeah, and I'm really glad you mentioned 63. I'm sure a lot of people heard this and they're like, oh my gosh, Mike's going to think that Citigroup's going to crash down to $40, you know, or something. <laughs> I, I'm sure somebody out there is thinking that, right? But no, Mike, it's a, it's just a short-term play, right? Yes, absolutely. And like, as we look at stocks like Citigroup, they move in relatively slow ways. Obviously, if we were looking at some like crazy EV, AI, semiconductor, SPAC play, then it would be a different story. But You know, when we look at like a well-established, pretty boring company like Citigroup, it's a little bit of a different story, which again, like you talked about yesterday though, Tom, you mentioned uh, Kraft Heinz, and even though that's a relatively boring stock, its options have some pretty big moves. So like, even though, you know, if we look at, let's say a boring stock, that doesn't mean its options are necessarily boring. Yeah, that's one really good point. I think a lot of people overlook a lot of high quality stocks and high quality options as well and just high quality moves in general because they're so stuck like in the, some of these tech stocks like Nvidia or SMCI or ARM or even like Apple and Microsoft, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to get out of like what they're used to. But um, with my first play, I'm looking at stock I actually don't look at too often, which is FSLR. And looking at FSLR in the short term, I really do like this 210 support down here. So as long as we hold 210, we get a good pushback above 215. I'll be looking at FSLR back to the upside. FSLR has been getting hit a lot in the short term. There's been a lot of uh, bloodiness associated with this stock, but I do like the support that it's holding in the short term. Now, if we wake up tomorrow and the 210 support's broken, then it's a no play, right? Pretty much, I'm going to have a tight stop under there. If that breaks, I'm out of the play. But nonetheless, I'll be watching FSLR back to the upside. 
All right, another stock I'm watching pretty closely is Coinbase, and it is also to the downside. Coinbase has had a great run over the past year, but it has been continuously making a lower highs, which is not good to see. And on top of that, we're even seeing a decent amount of selling pressure creep into Bitcoin, but nothing that's overly concerning just yet. But either way, I can see the flows uh, transitioning more to the bear side just across the market and across stocks that have been up so much over the past couple months and the past year and I think that is made especially obvious as we look again at the heat map and how we've been seeing some of the stocks that are up the most over the past year uh, start to lead the way to the downside so uh, basically what I'm looking to do is to be like proactive with uh, Coinbase here and uh, look at it in a bearish way I really like the you could say reward to risk going forward and a lot of it will also depend on the flows in the short term so like for example if tomorrow is a super green bullish day for the market it, it won't necessarily make sense to try and fight those flows on that day but as soon as we see like a continuation of this already existing bearishness that's where I think like the uh, advantage comes into play with a setup like this one so either way Coinbase is on my radar to the downside but I want to see a continuation of this bearishness first yeah, and I'm definitely with you on Coinbase here. It's getting a little bit overextended in the short term. You're definitely going to make the Bitcoin uh, followers angry here, Mike. Uh, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I, I'm with you, though, in the short term. I think the same thing, and I'm probably about to make a few people angry as well with uh, with with tesla in the short term we all know how tesla is uh tesla actually has a pretty good support here on the chart you can see right here at the bottom where i'm circling there's been a couple big hits and a good hold around this 246 to 248 area this week uh if we do see a good breakdown of this range and we start to see 246 give out I'm going to start to look at Tesla to the downside a lot more in the short term. Uh, Tesla has actually been moving up pretty well, as a lot of people know, over the past couple months. And to, to see it start to slow down like this is a bit of concern. Um, but if we do see support hold and it starts moving higher, and like let's say tomorrow you know, we wake up and the spy is bullish and Tesla is pushing back towards highs of days, I might even adapt and flip back to the upside, right? Obviously, follow the money. But uh, in the short term, I'm definitely watching that support very closely. And if it does give out, I will look at a downside opportunity. Yeah, and I love how you uh, you know mentioned that you're willing to adapt with it because sometimes people get so caught and anchored in like one direction and they don't have like any adaptability and then uh, you just, <laughs> it's just not a good thing. Like especially in the stock market where news is always coming out and sentiment is always changing. It's just so important to be willing to adapt and change your thesis. And I was also looking at Tesla's book map and there were a handful of pretty big levels on this one. Yeah, there definitely was. So in the short term, I mentioned that 246 to 248 range, and you can see on the book map, 246, 247, and 248 are all pretty significant. Now, I will say Tesla is pretty significant at just about every whole dollar mark, whether you're looking at like 251, 252, 253. There's pretty much uh, s sellers and buyers stacked there all the time. But I did see a pretty significant amount around that 248 mark. And even around market close, they pop right back in. So I'm really watching that 246 to 248. You can see it lined up right there on the book map. And you can see how on the order book on the right, the uh, green line even extends out a little bit showing the amount of shares like right here towards the end of day 247 had 53,000 shares stacked up there so you know you have to watch those areas where those buyers are stacked up sounds good well let's get right into today's momentum plays and with the first one we have amazon to the downside yeah, we talked about Amazon earlier, how they just couldn't move up today, even with those record Prime Day numbers. If they break under 181.50, then watch them back down. All right, with the next one, we have Oxy to the upside. Yeah, the oil stocks did pretty well again today. They did pull back a little around close, but if Oxy can break back above 64.50, then watch it up. All right, and then with the last one, we have Pfizer for both directions. PFE, a healthcare stock. Yeah, pretty wild today. If it breaks under 2960 in the short term, then watch Pfizer back to the downside. That's a pretty good support right there. If they end up re-breaking back above $30.10, then watch the price action back up. 
All right, well, you guys heard Tom. We have the upside level for a potential move higher. We have the downside level for a potential move lower. This is with Pfizer. Don't forget about the upside level with Oxy and the downside level with Amazon. But these are today's momentum plays. And let's jump right into today's $995,000 big money trade. And we are looking at ticker symbol BAC, which is Bank of America, and this is actually somewhat similar to the Citigroup setup that we talked about earlier in the video, but basically the big money today put just under a million dollars into the Bank of America 44 strike put options that expire on January 17th of 2025. These put options are already in the money. They have a good amount of time to them. The stock is also pretty overextended. There's a lot of big resistance coming up overhead, uh, especially from like uh, the end of 2021, right all the way up to like that $46 area. And we're also seeing some uh, selling pressure already creep into the stock, which is a good thing for this big money trade. So, so it's definitely an interesting one and what I like about this is like even in the event of like um, a further market sell-off a big money trade like this one can sort of act as a hedge play as we can see all the way in the bottom right corner Bank of America is pretty strongly correlated to SPY. Yeah, that's a pretty good thing, I'd say, for uh, for them, right? Especially with how much spy has been going up this year. But uh, in the short term, yeah, we are starting to see a bit of outflows, especially in the short term on these banks. They're pretty overextended. Whoever got this, I think, is trying to snipe the top here on these puts. So, uh, yeah, I like it quite a bit. I don't really see anybody is shorting those puts. I mean, it could always happen, right? You never know what an institution is doing or what positions that they end up having. But I will say that uh, Bank of America is very interesting in the short term, and almost all the banks are fairly overextended. So uh, I really like this big money play, and I'm not even going to say that I'm going to enter it right away, right? Like, I do think that there's a good potential for entry right away, but uh, just be careful over the next couple days. You know, we might see some chop, but Overall, I like this one quite a bit. Sounds good. So I know tonight's video was definitely longer than usual, but there's a lot to talk about and we want to make sure everyone is informed as they need to be as the market's heating up. As we've been saying over the past couple trading days, we are heading into a period of higher volatility. You have to be prepared for this going forward um, because if you're not, the, <laughs> you're going to see how much the market changes for multiple reasons. So again, let's make sure to deploy healthy, smart, long-term, sustainable trading habits have stop losses, and even more importantly, respect them. Be willing to adapt and change your thesis uh, at any moment and just trade in a way where it's like you know what you're going to do regardless of how the market moves because this is what truly allows people to trade with clarity and confidence and uh, trade in just a better, consistent way where your trades are more aligned with logic and reasoning rather than just short-term emotional decisions. So definitely keep that in mind going forward. And uh, we we have to give a giant shout out to today's member of the day today, Tom, which is ePlace22 in the stocked up trading floor. They've been in the trading floor for some time. They're a great active member of the community as well. So we just want to give a huge shout out to ePlace2022. E -place Keep up the great work and thanks for being a great member of the community. For those of you who are into short-term trading, definitely check out that first link in the description in the comments down below. The Stocked Up Trading Floor is the place to be where we you have access to all of our custom bots that took us years and a whole lot of money to make. You could join us every single week on our live events, access the big money trades on the same day the trades are made, chat with Tom and myself all day long, as well as many, many other great features. So uh, we do have a sale still running but we'll probably wrap it up in a couple days here so if you want in now's the time coupon code big money saves a ton with the yearly plan but besides that tom we have one more day left for the week so uh let's make it a good one yeah, let's definitely do it. I'm glad that there's nothing too crazy on the economic schedule. I really like this short-term support on stocks like Tesla. Um, of course, Amazon has a pretty decent support coming up here as well. There's a lot of short-term opportunities. And, you know, I know that a lot of people, obviously, if you're stuck to, stuck to the bullish side, it's not going to be the best time for you, right? But for the people that are adapting right now, we're experiencing some fun trading, right? It's fun to see UVXY moving up 4.46% in the day. VIX up 10% in the day. 
day. So uh, it's it's a very fun time to trade, Mike, especially if you're adapting into puts and just you know adapting to where the money's flowing, right? That's the name of the game. Follow the money. I don't know how long people have been saying that for the four in the stock market, Mike, but it must have been honestly since it started. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. Well, thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new. And besides that, let's crush it tomorrow.